Now it's time for the next uh, plenary. Uh, it's uh, going to be a talk by Professor Devaka Fernando. I don't think we need to introduce him. Uh, may I ask him to uh, speak on the resurgence of general internal medicine, the role of the internist? Over to you, sir. I think that um, thing about needs no introduction uh, has um, an amusing story behind it. I came with a colleague a couple of years ago. He's now a medical director down south. And we went out to one of the college dinners. And he made the remark to the audience um, uh, at some diabetes later dinner. I seem to be the only physician who was not trained by Professor Fernando. <laughs> so I felt a bit like that today. Uh, when, when Martin and I went round, uh, it seemed that I, there isn't a physician I haven't trained either as an undergraduate or <laughs> a postgraduate. So thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you very much for having me. Um, Seneca gave me an interesting topic, and I'll try to do justice to it in an evidence-based manner and try to trace this journey of general medicine in relation to my own journey since I qualified in 1981. So that's the uh, conflict of interest statement. Uh, so let me assure you that I am board certified in general medicine in Sri Lanka. Um, and that's all I'm board certified in Sri Lanka. But I'm on the specialist register in diabetes, endocrinology, metabolic medicine, and general internal medicine in the UK. So I come here before you as a Sri Lankan general physician. Um, it was very important that subspecialities develop at a time in the 1980s. And three very young but impertinent MD candidates just after passing, named Janaka De Silva, Chula Herat, and Devaka Fernando, wrote a letter to the director PGIM saying, as you can see, we just like to train in nephrology, gastroenterology, and diabetes and endocrinology in January 1987. In June, the director PGIM wrote to the Director General Health Services and said, is this possible? And the Director General Health Service replied in a matter of a week saying, yes, it's possible, but we can't guarantee these guys jobs in these specialities. And so the Director PGIM issued a letter saying that the diabetes and endocrinology dual accreditation post in the Manchester Royal Infirmary would be recognized for PGIM board certification. And accordingly, I was board certified as such in 1987. So that puts me in perspective in terms of my involvement in general medicine and endocrinology. And subsequently, I, as you know, I was the first chairman of the Board of Study in Endocrinology and the first trainer in endocrinology in Sri Lanka. So at that time, while working in the university as a general physician, I had a special interest. And we organized all these training programs in endocrinology. This one was held at Triton, uh, which some of you may have attended. And I continued to train people in general medicine. And you can see uh, Arosha and Arjuna, along with the two endocrinologists. So the first two endocrinologists to come to Sheffield, and the first among the first general physician trainees to come to Mansfield, uh, came at the same time. So I've taken this thing for granted, but like in everything in life, it's nice to have another look at it, and Seneca has given me that opportunity. So let's look at a little bit of the history of internal medicine, or general medicine. It's a very old uh, specialty, and there's work going back the millennia 
to the invisible diseases. This was probably the first reference to things that are internal. But later on, this was used by Paracelsus, uh, who translated, it is due to internal diseases. And then, of course, Boerhaave, the famous Dutch physician, also contributed uh, to the lexicon by referring to internal medicine. I've scrubbed your slides, uh, Seneca. I'm not going to quote them again because you've stolen my thunder in the introduction. Uh, but, but it all starts, I've kept this one because this is the first association of internal physicians, which was the German group. So it very rapidly became the important part of medicine. In fact, if you look at people like Osler, it was medicine. There was nothing else. Internal medicine was the very definition of medicine as a, as a specialty distinct from, from surgery. Um, in the UK, we like to be different in everything. It's like driving on the other side of the road and so on. So we call it general medicine. But in order to keep in line with European stuff, somewhere in the 1970s, the term general internal medicine was put in. We don't expect to drop the internal thing after Brexit, but it, I think it's going to be there to stay. So the relationship between the specialist and the generalist and their relative roles in the healthcare workforce has been a hot topic. I personally don't think that general internal medicine has been dethroned. Because if you look at the literature and if you look at, if you ask your students, if you ask your juniors, it's one bit they enjoy most. Perhaps not being med reg in today's NHS. I agree that's a very daunting prospect and many people are put off by it. But that's badly managed work. It's not the work itself that people are, are, are detesting. It is the responsibility, the overwork, and the stress that it placed upon them. Medicine remains still a very important speciality preference. So during the 80s, this paper was from the uh, from Journal of Internal Medicine early in this um, millennium. Uh, terminology has struggled to describe changing trends in the practice of internal medicine because different people do internal medicine differently. So generalists and specialists are totally different animals. The specialists know more and more about less and less, and the generalist knows little about a lot. Uh, George Bernard Shaw had some pity statements. He said, no, no man can be strictly a specialist unless he's strictly an idiot. So everybody has to have a bit of generalism. It's about what your day job is that matters, but you can't actually be a pure specialist. And that, that, that makes sense. So we've agreed from the presidential address that we take a broader view of things. And we tend to use less gadgets, and, and particularly with the opening lecture emphasizing clinical skills, we tend to rely a lot more on clinical skills and sound clinical judgment than most subspecialists. Perhaps exception of the neurologists who still remember their neurological signs uh, even though they have the CT. But we have to admit that subspecialities do form an important part of the healthcare workforce and, and they provide a core service for more complex problems. And therein lies the problem. They deal with complex problems. So this leads to a perception in the media, the public, and juniors that because they do things more complex, they've got to be cleverer and better. So if you deal with the brain, Chan and Martin, you got to be the cleverest of all, and if you operate on the brain, you're even better. So the neurosurgeon is the pinnacle if you talk to anybody 
in the lay public because they operate on the brain. So that's, generalism is less spectacular, less sexy as they say in the modern trends. And it's less appealing therefore to publicity. But yet, when the generalists do come up with some really important things, whether it's a sepsis score or methods of early diagnosis of common conditions, they are referred to as a specialist. So the word internist, I think, fits better, as the president said, than the general physician, because you can't be a specialist general physician. It sounds ridiculous. So how does it relate to the others? Well, certainly in the year 2000, the trend was that there was a clear distinction between internists who work in hospitals and those who worked outside. This was purely North American. So if you're an endocrinologist or a diabetologist in North America, you work in an office outside the hospital and you hardly ever go to hospital. Your patients are managed by a hospitalist. And it's the same uh, for other subspecialties. You were an attending while there were hospitalists in the hospital. Uh, in many other countries, this distinction was not very clear. And certainly the distinction between general practice and general medicine overlapped because you could have people called an internist in primary care. And there were colleagues of my father's because my dad trained in the US uh, in the 60s who were actually board certified in both internal medicine and family medicine. So you could actually do that, but that was commercial, isn't it? You, 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 somebody walks in through the front door and you see them as a general practitioner and they happen to have asthma, then you've got the credentials to treat that asthma as a specialist. And instead of the $5 consultancy fee that the, he used to get, they could get a $15 to $30 consultation fee for the specialist. So there's a system of valuation as well, which made the generalist less important than the specialist. So usually the general practitioner is the first line practitioner. They're, they, they treat gynecology surgery and so on, so we don't consider them a physician, although they do a significant amount of work that a physician used to do. So 25 to 30 years ago, well, possibly longer, people used to refer to the cardiologist a mysterious disease, which was a, quite an enigma in general practice, uh, where there was a confusing array of new and radical drugs uh, that were changing all the time. And this disease was hypertension. So we've come a long way. Hypertension is a general practitioner managed disease in the UK now. We don't have professors of hypertension. As a senior registrar, I worked with David Tunbridge, who spent his entire life studying hypertension. His PhD was on it, and he had a hypertension clinic. Uh, and I worked with him because all the secondary hypertensions came to him. So there was an actual university professor who specialized in hypertension. Not so much now. It's almost epidemiology. So things have changed. So this task shifting and skill shifting is also going to change the definition of internal medicine at some point. Um, there's also the criticism of the internist that we are breaking up into organ-based specialities. And societies like yours are trying to prevent this fragmentation. And this was known in 2000. So the concern in the US was around that time as in, the, as in Europe. So this is from the European uh, Journal of Internal Medicine. The US invented the hospitalist. So the hospitalist was a hospital-based person who worked only in the hospital. If you came in acutely ill and went to a general internal medicine ward, you looked after them. So that's what we do in our day job. Uh, if I go into my departmental ward, <clears throat> we've got 24 beds. Only eight of those beds are occupied by anything that could be remotely called diabetes and endocrinology. 
And if you remove the six people with diabetic foot ulcers waiting to go to the vascular surgeon, there are probably the two patients who've got diabetic ketoacidosis who are excellently and well treated by the acute physicians who are just waiting to go home. So actually, there is no such thing as inpatient endocrinology, and the American guys who say it's an office-based specialty probably got it right. Uh, so most of the time, we would be general physicians. So I work as a hospitalist, in other words, one week in six, and we call it the hot week. So I like to believe that general medicine is alive and kicking, even within the so-called subspecialists. And as it says on the slide, most hospitalists were internists in the US. The training of internists has been a contentious one. You could be a cardiologist through a straight cardiology rotation. You could be a neurologist through a straight neurology rotation. You could be an oncologist through a straight oncology rotation. And that's there in Sri Lanka as well. Fortunately, if you want to be a nephrologist, a cardiologist, or a gastroenterologist, Sri Lanka still makes you pass the MD. That's not gone yet. But oncology and hematology are non-physician-based specialties in Sri Lanka, which is rather strange if you come from the UK. So there is direct entry into subspecialty training in Sri Lanka. It's not such an alien concept. So it's something that needs perhaps to be looked at. And the criticism is that it produces a narrow-minded, organ-oriented doctor. Some of the best general physicians I've come across are people who treat HIV. Now, there's a I believe there's a College of Sexual Medicine in Sri Lanka, uh, which again is a straight run-through program without general medicine. So one wonders how such a multi-speciality, multi-system disease can be managed without a training in general medicine. So it is possibly a historic accident of history, but it's something that needs to be looked at critically if the PGIM and indeed the Ministry of Health is going to look at the future of general medicine. So I'm a firm believer that subspecialists should have the common trunk of basic internal medicine in their initial training. Whether it is core medical training, which we have in the UK, in addition to that, there is a stream of general internal medicine training throughout. So if you're a cardiology registrar, a neurologic registrar, uh, you are still going to be med reg on an acute take for a significant period of time. So from a UK perspective, it has always been the case. There's no run through. But I recognize that in other countries it has been different, and particularly in Europe, there was a lot of concern. So the competing arguments for the case of the disappearing generalist, the one, the pros would say they are an important and scarce resource and must be conserved, like the elephants. Others would argue that subspecialists can replace the generalists and by team working, we can sit around the table, talk to each other, and then get around this. And from an organizational point of view, the US model is that the free market, let the patient divide, decide. So you have people going to see, my, my relatives in Sri Lanka go to see, on an average, four different specialists by the time they get to 70. They see a rheumatologist, they see a diabetologist, they see a cardiologist, and if they get a headache, they might even go and see a neurologist. And this is one of the most difficult things for me to do as a, as a son, is to stop my only surviving parent from being taken by other relatives to a catalog of specialists. It's very difficult when you're miles away, but somehow I managed to keep, it, keep her safe so far. Um, so these are the competing viewpoints that were used to make major policy decisions. It depends on where you are, centrally controlled or market-oriented. So there was the medical outcome study, which was um, reported in 1992 about the economic consequences, and, uh, and it was dire. They said that it would drive the cost of healthcare up, but it would make the doctors better off. 
So it's not a patient-centered thing. It is a, not a taxpayer-centered thing. Subspecialization is good for doctors. It's very good. But if you work in an organization like the NHS, where it is taxpayer-funded, it becomes a resource-expensive process. Because the number of referrals, the number of handovers that you've got to give, and the number of handoffs that you've got to give for an inappropriate referral, all costs in time and money. So the more complex a system, and any medical manager will uh, appreciate this, the more complex a system, the more expensive it gets. So having more specialists actually makes it more complex. So do we need to solve the problem? Well, in the United States, this was a big problem in 1992. And they predicted these dire consequences. And again, the pros and cons. Subspecialists can, sub can provide them, so who cares if they disappear? So the comparison of outcomes for a discrete medical uh, condition was a, was a very um, good study. Uh, so essentially the s lessons were that having subspecialists was necessary, but having generalists doing the bulk of the clinical workload was better. So certainly the value of this in highly specialized person is indisputable. Uh, but even for the management of people with chronic disease, do we really need a specialist? Do we need a diabetologist was one of the questions that were asked then. And more on that later. So with society changing, certainly with thrombolysis and with some of the cardiac innovations, the person at the cutting edge is usually a subspecialist. And therefore society, again, as I said before, values them more. So narrowing the gap between generalist and specialist income might perhaps have some policy implications. So there's prestige, there's income. These are the drivers of the fragmentation into subspecialties. The, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy about self-worth, so non-economic societal incentives become necessary if this trend is to be changed. What about mentorship? Fortunately, I don't seem to have persuaded most of my juniors to become an endocrinologist or a diabetologist. Uh, there's enough general physicians and enough neurologists and cardiologists in the lot. But students are influenced by mentors. Students are influenced by the people they work with. They make decisions on careers based on people they admire. And I almost became a surgeon because a person I admired very much um, Professor Dasri Fernando was one of my mentors. I even did the FRCS Edinburgh and passed it uh, before I saw the light and did the MRCP. So it happens. It certainly happened to me. So the medical school experience, the people you admire, actually dictate quite a lot on your quality of uh, choice of specialty. And there are some statements here uh, that Efforts to consider inc be, be more, more inclusive in multi-speciality departments. So the university departments in Sri Lanka probably offer a very good grounding for undergraduates because unlike in the UK, they are not mono-speciality departments. So that seems to be something to be preserved uh, and something which hopefully will endure. Obviously, the job market determines it, and this is very applicable in the UK. People look at where the jobs are, where are the expansions going to be, and in the 1980s and 90s, many of my colleagues who were looking for a specialty in the UK decided not to do neurology because there were massive cuts in neurology services at the time, followed by a massive boom later on. And it was the same for cardiology. There was the boom of interventional cardiology. So in the US, there were some really good policy decisions. The Robert Wood Foundation actually gave fellowships to fund training programs in internal medicine, and they were very successful. So 
despite these, many Western countries chose not to control, although some do control, generalist to specialist ratio. The UK offers free choice. I hope you don't mind my going a bit over. Um, so, inclusion of generalist skills to general uh, medical subspecialties and pediatric disciplines is only a good thing. And, and those are now being put into practice, and I'll touch on the Royal College's take on this. So the New England Gen Journal editorial in the year 2000 addressed this. And they predicted that medical care will increasingly become a team effort. So this was the teams of subspecialists meeting at a multidisciplinary team. And it certainly has come true in a certain extent. Now, economically, I referred to those who are based office-based and work in hospitals, and this happened in the US. Now, this was predicted by the New England Journal of Medicine, who were quite concerned about it. So what is the environment I work in? Uh, and, and because um, I've been involved in training and because I've been involved in the college activities around the PACES and, and various international initiatives, it's just something of, I've had to be in my bonnet about this for some time. And we've managed to work on this through the colleges. And here's what the website says from the college. So particularly with older people and longer term conditions, does it really matter whether you have a specialist ologist looking after them or somebody who can look after all their conditions? What's more important, continuity of care or multiple handoff, handovers? So clearly, the decision was that we need more GIM specialists. And dual trained physicians Supporting the acute tech is the formula for which the colleges have supported as a mean way forward for the NHS. So everybody should contribute to non-selected takes. And if you, if you read some of the stuff around becoming an examiner, any, those of you who applied to be a PACES examiner would have read this phrase, the non-selected take. So to provide this high quality and to give that continuity, it is mandated by the future hospitals program that there should be a daily ward round, a daily ward round by a consultant. And Channa mentioned that any patient admitted to hospital, whatever the condition, must be seen by a consultant within 14 hours. So that's a daily ward round. The 14 hours instead of 12 is because of the overnight, uh, the lack of resources to have a, or the lack of a need actually to have a consultant resident overnight. So everybody's seen in 14 hours. That, that is an essential requirement and a standard that has been set. So how do we provide that? By having acute physicians who, who, who run an acute service and by having the general internal medicine specialists who support them. So if you look at the college website, you will see two curricula, AIM and GIM. And if you study them, you see that there's significant amount of overlap. There's also a significant amount of overlap between the AIM curriculum and say managing an acute stroke and managing diabetic ketoacidosis. It does not mean that they are specialists in that, the stroke specialists still remain doing that, but the front door management recognizing these things and de delivering the patient to the right specialist is the function of these generalists. So this is the truth about the UK now. There are some like the gastroenterologists who say that you should have a special rota for, to deal with bleeding and therefore they cannot be general internal physicians. That's not universally true. It is true in my trust. Uh, but, but lots of trusts have GIM, uh, GIM on course for gastroenterologists. So now, nearly all trainees following the GIM curriculum to CCT will do it in parallel. GIM in isolation 
is very rare. So there won't be anybody who is a pure GIM specialist in the UK coming through a CCST program, a CCT program, but if one is getting on the specialist register through Article 14, it is still possible to get GIM alone as a mono accreditation. So it's always dual accreditation. This is important because if, if otherwise we might have a workforce crisis. Sri Lanka, for instance, you allow, if somebody becomes an endocrinologist, you've got to give them an endocrinology job. If somebody becomes a cardiologist, you've got to employ them as a cardiologist, and so on. But if there's dual accreditation, many of our trainees actually do GIM posts and AIM posts. So it's a way of workforce management as well. Perhaps not to the liking of doctors, but from a resource point of view, a very cost-effective way of managing this conundrum. So the Future Hospitals Commission report has highlighted all this, and it's available on the website. I'm sure you'll be able to uh, get this from there. So the UK view is that for the next decade, we'll see considerable growth in new GIM positions. It is the most, one of the most rapidly growing accreditations. So as you can see, the proportion of physicians maintaining a commitment to the acute medical take increased from 54.1% in 2010 to 64.1% in 2014. Of course, people over the age of 60 are told they can duck out of it, uh, although I'm still on the rota. So these are some of the problems that we have. Particularly frail elderly patients often get readmitted. And I'll just skip through this briefly uh, to talk about the extensivist, which is the new role for the generalist. This is based on a Medicare plan in the US, which basically said daily inpatient ward round. So much of the future hospitals program is based on this. A daily ward round by a consultant can improve patient flow, improve quality of medical care, and prevent readmissions. That's the basis of that study. And the results actually showed that lower lengths of stay, lower readmission rate, and below average inpatient utilization in high acuity population. So less admissions, basically. So why is this? Well, this is a study from Glasgow which showed that only 14% of people with diabetes had only diabetes as a specialty, as, as a disease. They had other comorbidities like congestive cardiac failure, chronic kidney disease. So does this mean that, like my mother's relatives, that these people should see four specialists? The answer in the UK is not. And with my hat of a clinical commissioner, this is a slide that somebody put on, saying that these all can be managed by a generalist. The ABCD to G approach of diabetes, coronary heart uh, congestive cardiac failure, some aspects of coronary heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, CKD, the preventative aspects could be handled <coughs> elsewhere. So just to summarize, whether physicians remain within a specialty depends on personal and societal values, the market condition, the postgraduate training experience, the quality of practice in that specialty, and the sense of appreciation. All these will apply to Sri Lanka as they do to the UK. So in conclusion, I will finish with the last line, fulfilling the ancient and honorable role of, in the modern world will continue to be a goal and challenge to internal medicine, and I think it's in good hands in your society. So it's possible to be dual accredited, it's possible to train together, it's possible to train them together. And my apologies if I've over the cake. Thank you very much, Professor Fernando. I think you've given us a lot of hope that there is a resurgence of internal medicine. You'd be sad to hear that this year, for the first time, the Ministry of Health, uh, when they give us a list of allocations for uh, trainees to choose a specialty, that they've restricted the number of general internal medicine or internal medicine specialists or general medicine specialists to 50% uh, of the total number. It's never happened before. In the past, there was always any trainee who passes the MD could um, opt to do general medicine, and uh, there was no restriction on the number. 
So it looks like the trend is not ideal at the moment, but we'll work on it. So this brings us to the close of the session and the close of the conference. Um, uh, I'm very thankful to Professor Fernando for giving us the clo closing plenary. And uh, may I present you with the certificate?